Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Are you guys there? Good evening. I can hear you. Good evening. Azas, are you here? We are here. Oh, good. Thank you. We're going to start in one minute. Please make sure that you complete the register. The link is shared in the chat. And let me know if you are able to see my my screen. It is five past six, so we can start with today's session. Welcome to another session of our basic statistics skills literacies. Um, please complete the register and remember the two emails. If you have any challenges technically, you can send the email to ctntat at unisa.ac.za. If you have any questions regarding your module, you can also send a query to me and cccct and tat at unisa.ac.za. Today's session, which is the 6th of September, we're going to be looking at hypothesis testing for one sample test or one group. Um, and uh, we're going to look at how we do a hypothesis testing. What are the basic concepts of that? But before we start with today's session, I just want to share the session plan for the next coming topics that we're going to be discussing. Uh, next week, Tuesday, we're going to be looking at hypothesis testing for two samples. And the following week, we're going to be looking at the correlation and to the last week, we're going to be looking at uh, the chi-square. So that is the schedule for the entire September. OK. Based on the information given and any other things that we have done previously, do you have any question, comment, or query that you want us to iron out? before we start with today's session. Uh, nope, you don't have any, any question. So you are all good. Okay. So if there are no comments or questions, Please bear in mind that I can't see the chat box in case someone is typing. Let me go there. Okay, so there is no comment or query or anything like that. Okay, Ooh, so you are all happy we can start with today's session. Like I said, today's session, we're going to be looking at hypothesis testing. Um, for today's session, there might be a time where you are required to use some statistical tables. Uh, we did look at the statistical table um, earlier when, uh, I think in the previous sessions, where we were calculating probabilities, especially when we were calculating the Z value. So with hypothesis testing, we are going to get the test statistic or we need to be calculating the p-value. We just need to know how to get that p-value or how to get the, uh, the other information that we might need to use, like the critical value in order to allow us to make any decision. Because hypothesis testing in a nutshell, it's about you proving some claim and make a decision based on that claim, right? Whether you are going to reject the claim or you're going to accept the claim, 
will be based on some sort of a decision that you are making. And you also need to know the formulas, like I've mentioned, the test statistic. A test, a test statistic is a formula that you need to be calculating. You will substitute the value into that formula and calculate. Some of these are very tricky to calculate. I'm going to demonstrate it using my calculator. Therefore, it means you need to have a calculator with you. I will be using the Casio calculator uh, that I have online. Uh, but if you are having another different calculator, like a sharp calculator, you just need to let me know. And then probably I can also demonstrate using the sharp calculator as well but I need to know what type of a calculator you are using. And most of the calculators, they have the same functions. So it will be easier um, that I demonstrate uh, how you can use your calculator as well. Um, <clears throat> so let me know when we get to that step. Okay, so, And in the meantime, you can also type in the chat the type of a calculator that you have. For example, if it's a Sharp or a Casio or those other calculators name um, that I'm not mentioning now, like a Casia, which is K-A-R-C-E that you can get at Chagas or Pick and Pay or any other calculator. But please make sure that you put that on the chat so that I'm aware of the type of calculators that everyone is is having. If you are using your phone, also you can just put there and tell me that you are using a phone. And then after this session, I can also share a proper calculator that you can also use. Okay, so by the end of the session today, you will learn two things. Uh, when you leave the session, you should know the basic principles of doing a hypothesis testing and Two, you should learn how or you should be able to know how to use the hypothesis testing to make a decision, especially the hypothesis testing of the me. That's what we're going to be looking at. OK, so I want to go back to a decision tree uh, for statistics, uh, test statistic that we discussed earlier. Um, this helps us with hypothesis testing in a way. In order for you to know what type of hypothesis testing you need to be doing, this decision tree will help you figure out. So if we need to test a difference between one group, then it is what we're going to be doing today. You need to make sure that you know at least two things, whether the population standard deviation is given or known, or whether the population standard deviation is unknown. Those are the very two decisions that you need to be able to make or, or things that you need to be able to make in order for you to know what type of a, a hypothesis testing you need to be making. Or if we are given two groups, you also need to classify. So uh, the next week we will be looking at how we do hypothesis testing for two groups. And then the other two sessions that will be left, we will look at how we do hypothesis testing for the relation to test the relationship between two numerical values and look oh sorry, two two variables. And here we're looking at numerical values. We will be using that the correlation and to test the relationship for the categorical data, we will be looking at the chi squared. But we will look at this in detail in future. So today session, we are only going to be concentrating on the orange section. Okay. So now, what is hypothesis testing? So a hypothesis testing is an inferential procedure that uses the sample data to evaluate the credibility of a hypothesis about the population. Or we can say it evaluates the credibility of a claim about the population. 
And a hypothesis testing is a claim about a value of the parameter. And remember always, a parameter are your data values that comes from a population. So it's a claim about the parameter or what we call a population characteristics, or it could be a combination of parameters, or it is about the form of an entire probability distribution. For the purpose of today's session, we are going to use, uh, we are going to define our hypothesis testing as a claim about a value of the parameter because in this instance we are going to be using one group. Next week we will be looking at a combination of parameter or a combination of groups because we're going to be looking at this, uh, the difference between two groups. Okay, there are steps that you need to know and follow as you do your hypothesis testing. You just don't do everything anywhere, every time. You need to follow proper procedure or proper steps. And there is a logic in terms of how you do your hypothesis testing. And the first step of doing a hypothesis testing is to state your hypothesis statement. And this is the claim that the researcher wants to prove. So we, we state a hypothesis, which is your claim about the population. And there are two statements that you use to claim or to prove your claim. Because let's look at, let's say, for example, if you look at a coin, a coin has two sides, right? There is a head and the tail. So for example, you can say as a researcher, I want to prove that every time I toss a coin, it lands on a head. That is your claim that we need to prove. So the opposite would be to claim or to disprove what you wanted to prove, right? What you are claiming, sorry. The, the alternative of your hypothesis will be to disprove what you have claimed. And this is the same method as um, uh, when you go to, uh, when you get arrested, we always say you are innocent until proven guilty. And that is what, when you go to court, you need to make sure that you prove your claim of innocence and the other side needs to prove a claim of uh, you being guilty. So there are two sides to the to the um, the hypothesis. So there is always going to be a null hypothesis, which is what the researcher is proving, and the alternative, which will reboot or or um, it will be the inverse of what the researcher is claiming. Step number two: you need to be able to define the type of a decision method that you're going to be doing or using to make a decision. And here we're talking about creating your uh, areas, um, your, we call, we call this the critical areas or the area of rejection or the area where you're going to make a decision based on that. And we define this uh, method to make a decision about the hypothesis by using either the critical value or by using the p-value. So it, you can define it by using the p-value, which is the probability value, or by using the critical value. And we will look at examples to make it easier to understand. Step number three is where you have to calculate your test statistic. So it means you need to make sure that you understand what you are given in order for you to be able to calculate or substitute and calculate your test statistic. And your test statistics can also be dependent on whether you're doing a Z test statistics based on whether the population standard deviation is given or you're going to do a T test whether your sample standard deviation is given and those two will determine how you 
um, calculate your test statistic, but the formula looks almost exactly the same. We're going to look at that. Um, and when the other thing going back to step number two is that I forgot to mention that when you decide the type of a decision method that you're going to be using as well, you need to take into consideration whether the population standard deviation is given or known and whether it is unknown because both of them, especially when you go find the critical value, they will be found on two different tables. One table have the critical values of Z and the other table will have the critical values of T. So you need to be able to identify clearly what is given in the, in the statement in order for you to guide you in terms of the region of rejection. Step number four is where you're going to make a decision based on the test statistic that you would have calculated in step number three and your critical value. Or you will make your decision based on your test statistic. You will use that to go and find the p-value and use the p-value and the level of significance which is set. The level of significance is set by the researcher at the beginning. So you will have to set that alpha value or the level of significance. So and based on that, based on, so there are two ways that you can make a decision, not to co confuse you. Two ways to make a decision. One, you can make the decision based on the critical value and the test statistic, or you can make a decision based on the T value, the P, P value, which is your probability value, your P value and your level of significance. And when you make your decision by comparing the sample data with the hypothesis about the population, you are usually going to compare the value of your statistic computed, which is your test statistic, from the sample data with the hypothesized value of your population parameter, where you will see when you calculate the test statistic, you will be using the sample data and subtracting um, your population parameter from there. And that will help you to make a decision by comparing the answer to that, to the critical value. And we will get to the steps very soon or shortly. And I'm going to also show you some easy way of doing um, the hypothesis or making a decision by drawing a table or a normal distribution graph for yourself to visualize how you make a decision, but we'll get to that. Now, when making a decision, we always refer to this as the burden of a proof. And we also say this burden of a proof is placed on those who believe in the alternative. And in the testing of the statistical hypothesis, the problem will be formulated so that one of the claim is initially favored. So it means we, when you, you state your hypothesis, right, you're going to say there is a difference between, oh, that's the other thing that I need to mention. You will state that there is a difference between, um, the, or you, they will, you will say there is, um, uh, the the population mean is equals to this, so it means there is no difference. Then the alternative will say there is a difference because they will not be equal. Or you could say there is a dif there is no difference, and then the alternative can say uh, it is more than or it is less than. So you you also need to be aware of how you state your alternative as well, because at the end of the day, when you do your testing of your hypothesis, one of the statement will be highly favored. The initial favored claim, which will be your researcher's claim, this initial favored claim will not be rejected in favor of the alternative claim which we can represent the favored claim as your null hypothesis, which can H subscript zero or, or O. And the alternative, we always write it with H and a subscript A for alternative or H with subscript one. 
unless, okay, so the initially favored claim will not be rejected in favor of the alternative claim unless the sample evidence uh, contradicts um, the, the claim that the researcher wanted to prove and provides a strong support for the alternative assertion. If the sample does not strongly contradict your null hypothesis, we will continue to believe in the um, possibility of your null hypothesis. So there will be two conclusions that you will make. Either we're going to favor the null hypothesis or we're not going to favor the null hypothesis. So how you make the decision comes to two. You will either reject your null hypothesis, which will be the claim that you have stated or the researcher have stated and wants to prove, or you will fail to reject the null hypothesis. And this is how you are only going to interpret your decision in this two men you will not introduce any other way of uh, uh, uh not rejecting and say you are accepting or you are we don't use those words you only going to use these two bits you either reject the null hypothesis or you fail to reject the null hypothesis those are the only two ways or two possible ways that you will make a decision. So when you make a decision, so for example, there are certain criteria that are used in the hypothesis testing in a way. When you state a null hypothesis, so let's say I need to state the null hypothesis. Your null hypothesis can only take the following sides. So let's say we want to prove that the mean is equals to zero. That is the only way we can prove, or let's say it's equals to 10, let's put it 10 minutes and not 100. Let's make it 100, let's make it bigger because it's the population. So let's say the null hypothesis, the researcher wants to claim that the mean, the population mean is equals to 100 because remember, it is the, the hypothesis is always about the population parameter, right? So the population mean is equals to 100. The other way of stating this, you could also state that the null hypothesis will state that the mean is greater than or equals to 100. Or you can state that the mean, the mean is less than or equals to 100. Now, we all agree that for now, that the null hypothesis, it is what we want to claim, what the researcher wants to prove. It lies in the burden of proof, right? In your null hypothesis. What if the researcher says, the mean is less than, so they then that statement of less than can never go in the hypothesis testing, uh, null hypothesis testing statement, because in the null hypothesis, the statement always contains an equal sign. Your statement will always contain the equal sign in your null hypothesis. In your alternative hypothesis, which uh, let's use HA, in your alternative hypothesis, the statement does not contain the equal sign. Always remember that. Therefore, it means in your alternative of equal, you will state that the mean is not equal. In this instance, you will state that the HA, the mean is less than. You will state the opposite of what the null hypothesis is stating. So the mean is less than. And for the less than, you will state that the mean, the mean is greater than 100. Now, if the researcher wants to prove less than, you are going to put it in your alternative. Therefore, when you make a decision, 
can reject the null hypothesis, you are rejecting a false null hypothesis because your null hypothesis is what the researcher wants to prove and the researcher wanted to prove that the mean is less than 100. That comes to what I want to explain right now, the errors. So when you are making a hypothesis testing decision, sometimes you will be creating uh, or making those decisions and creating errors. And this, they can happen anytime. So this we call them the errors in hypothesis testing. And there are two types of errors that can occur. One, the first error that can occur is called type one error. So type one error is when the null hypothesis is rejected but when it is true. So let's assume that the researcher wants to prove that the mean is equals to 100. So since the, the researcher wants to prove that the mean is equals to 100, therefore the alternative will be the mean is not equals to 100. When we get to the decision of whether we reject or do not reject the hypothesis, or we fail to reject the, hypo the null hypothesis, let's assume that we're going to reject this null hypothesis. When we reject this null hypothesis, it is when the null hypothesis we are rejecting is true. Therefore, it means at this point, we are committing what we call a type one error. Right, so we we will be committing a type one error, and a type one error is what gets committed almost all the time because we always have the statement of your null hypothesis as what your researcher wants to prove, and if we reject that, then we are committing a type one error. Now, here is the scenario. Let's assume that the researcher wants to prove that the mean is less than 100. So this is what the researcher wants to prove. So let's assume that we are not, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, therefore we, we say this null hypothesis is true. And because this is not what the null hypothesis that we have there is not what the researcher wanted to prove. Therefore, we are committing what we call a type 2 error. A type 2 error is when, sorry, if we are not rejecting, sorry, probably I'm stating it wrong. If we're not rejecting the null hypothesis, so if we are not, if we fail to reject this null hypothesis, so we are accepting it. Therefore, we are committing what we call a type 2 error. A type 2 error is when we are not rejecting the null hypothesis when it is false, because this is not what the researcher wanted to prove. So we are not rejecting it, we are accepting it. So we're creating a type 2 error. So a type, this type of errors are very similar to how you do a diagnostic test. So, for example, when you go to the doctor and, the, and you don't have cancer and you say to the patient that they have cancer, you are creating some sort of an error right there. That's why um, in medical sense, uh, we try to minimize when we do some hypothesis testing, you're trying by all means not to commit a lot of these errors because you want to make sure that you give the patient the right uh, uh, diagnostic. So let's, if we put the uh, type one error in terms of a matrix like this, you will be able to see when we have the null hypothesis, whether we're rejecting the null hypothesis or not rejecting the null hypothesis, when it's true or false, where you will be creating a type 1 error and a type 2 error. So you will be rejecting a null hypothesis when it's true 
you are creating a type one error. But if you are rejecting it and it was a false one, then you are making the correct decision. And if you are rejecting or not rejecting a true null hypothesis, then you are also making a, a, a correct decision. So therefore it means if you place number of people and you group them and some falls here and some falls here, therefore it means you need to relook at your results and retest so that you can correctly classify the people into the groups that they need to fall in and not in the red. The red, red is bad. Okay, so those are the types of errors that can happen when you're doing a hypothesis testing. Okay, so when and how do we state a hypothesis testing statement? So to state a null hypothesis, like I explained, remember from this statement that I have, a null hypothesis always contains an equal sign, regardless of whether you have a less than and less than or equal, we always write equal. So if our null hypothesis always have an equal sign with the value of the null hypothesis that we're going to be calculating, and here we're doing a hypothesis testing for the mean when the population standard deviation is known, um, our test statistic, we're going to use the Z, and this is the formula for the test statistic, which is the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the standard error, which is your population standard deviation divided by the square root of N. So if our null hypothesis states that the mean is equals to zero, or the mean is greater than zero, the mean is less than a, a value, um, the null hypothesis always has an equal sign, so we just use the equal sign. The alternative, however, has to have the actual sign because this is very important. The sign that you place on your alternative hypothesis tells you how you're going to make a decision and it gives you information regarding what type of a test are you doing. So, for example, if the alternative states that it is greater than the value, then when you do go and find your critical value, you need to make sure that you understand that when the sign says less than, how do you find the critical value on the Z table because we are using the Z value. So to find the critical value, we are only going to use alpha, which is our level of significance. Alpha is our level of significance. So we're going to use only alpha because it is a one-sided test. Also, when it says it is less than, you're also going to use alpha because it is just going to be on one side. So in terms of the normal distribution uh, visualization that I was referring to, so when you create this region of rejection, you are going to draw yourself a picture and because this says it's greater than, so your null hypothesis looks, or your normal distribution looks like this. So you just going to go to the greater than sign, which is on the right side, so on the right side, you're just going to shade some area, just a little bit of it. And you're going to say this is where your Z alpha will be. And that will give you the region of rejection. And if anything falls in this side, because it says if your test statistic is greater than or equals to your Z critical value, then you're going to reject your null hypothesis. That's what the region of rejection mean. It means if it falls bigger than the critical or the region of rejection, which is our critical value of Z alpha, the test statistic that we have calculated here, if it falls on the red side, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. If it falls on the white side, let me write it at the top here. Oh no, I can write it here as well. If it falls here, we're going to fail 
to reject the null hypothesis. So in the white area, we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. In the red shaded area, we're going to um, reject the null hypothesis. And this is also what we call a one directional or a directional one test. When it's uh, when it's less than, this is less than, this is greater than in width, this is greater than, and this is less than. When it is less than, therefore, the region of rejection will be, I'm sorry, I don't know how to draw, but it's fine. I'm just going to shade this area that I can draw properly. So we're only going to shade this area and we're going to call it because right in the middle of this graph there is zero there because the mean of a normal distribution is pop it's distributed with the mean of zero and the standard deviation of one so it means right here at the middle it's zero so anything on the anything this side on the right of zero it's positive anything on the left is negative so therefore it means the critical value on the less than it will be negative z alpha. Hence, if our test statistics is less than or equals to the critical value in our lower tail test, which is the area there, we're going to reject the null hypothesis if it falls in this shaded red area site, or we're going to uh, fail to reject if it falls in the white shaded area. Right, that is easy for a directional test. Directional, either when it's greater than or when it's less than. When it is not equal, then it's a two-tailed test. We call a non-directional test because the decision that you will make on this, it will be on two sides. So because it is a non-directional and it's not equal, therefore there are two areas that you're going to make decisions from. You're going to have the Z alpha over two. Okay, so that will be Z alpha over two, negative on the other side, and on the other side, it will be a positive Z alpha over two. Now, with a non-directional test, we are, going to divide our alpha value by two. When we do, when we do the example, I'm going to show you how you do that. So a non-directional test, we divide alpha by two. A directional test, we use alpha value as we see it to go find the critical value. Are there any questions? I know that I have done, I've, I've been talking Greek, to most of you, but are there any question, anything that you don't understand right now um, that you want me to explain more? Otherwise, then it will make make or it will get clearer when we do examples. Uh, Keshio, Keshio, I'm using my phone calculator. Okay, I'm using a phone. Keshio, Keshio. So I don't have to use the sharp i will just use the case show then that's fine okay cool now <clears throat> thank you for that okay so this is how you are going to state your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis and how you're going to find the region of rejection and how you're going to make a decision because your critical value is going to help you to make a decision anything that falls in the uh, Shaded area, we're going to reject. Anything in the white area, we do not reject. And that's how I, it makes it easier for me to understand how to make a decision by visualizing this region of rejection and the decisions. Okay, so this is almost exactly the same as what I've just explained in terms of where do you find your region of rejection and how you find uh, you make a decision. So, but in terms of, remember, I told you that there are two ways of making a decision, either by using the 
region of rejection or what we call the critical value. I, I just need to find the right way that you are also using. Uh, so you can use the region uh, re rejection origin and test statistics. That's number one. Number two, you can use the p-value and the level of significance. Now, what do I mean by the p-value? The p-value and the level of significance, you can only find it if you're using the population where the standard deviation is unknown. Therefore, it means only for z test. When you are doing a Z test, you can use the P value. If we're doing a T test, you can use the P value. So for T test, we don't have to calculate the P value unless they have given you the P value. So we have made an establishment that with the region of rejection, we are able to find those shaded areas and we make a decision based on that but when it comes to the p value there um the the decision is that if the p value is less than your alpha value then you're going to reject the null hypothesis so this is the decision decision rule states that if if the p value is less than alpha then we reject the null hypothesis that is when you have the z test statistic you're going to use the z test statistic to go and find the probability on the table we have done this when we were doing the probabilities we calculated the Z value and then we went and found the probability. P value is the same thing as the probability value. So it's the value on the table, inside the table. <clears throat> so what happens when you use the P value for a two tail test? So it's the same thing. P value less than your alpha value, you reject the null hypothesis, but I will show you how to find the p-value and how do we calculate it for one-sided test and also for a two-sided test. What are the p-values? Like I've been saying it, the p-value is a probability of observing values of the test statistics that are as contradictory or even more contradictory to your null hypothesis. This is the probability that is calculated, assuming that the null hypothesis is true and uh, you will calculate it uses, using the test statistic, all right? Be aware, the p-value is not the probability that H0 is true. It's not because we use the p-value to make a decision. No, it is an error probability. The p-value is between 0 and 1, and these are the things that you still need to remember from the probability section that we did, or the session that we did on probabilities, where we, def we said the value of a probability is always going to be between 0 and 1. So the p-value as well needs to be between 0 and one. Therefore, it is very important to know when it is a less than or when it is a greater than, how do you find the p-value and when, whether you're going to find the p-value in the smallest area or in the larger uh, area. And when it is not equal, how do we find the p-value? Because then we need the area of the two values. So select a significance level, which is your alpha, which probably will always be given to you in the statement because it gets to be set at the beginning. As before, the desired type one error probability, then 
your alpha value defines what the region of rejection will be. Then the decision will be, we're going to reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less than alpha, or we do not, or we say we fail to reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is greater than or equals to, oh, sorry, it's greater than alpha. Don't worry, we'll get to that. When, when you do hypothesis testing as well, especially when we calculate the test statistic, there is what we need to consider, what we call the effect size. And it is a determinant of the sensitivity of a, or a power of a statistical test, um, which looks at the sample size. So in terms of the effect size, it talks to what you do or what happens when you increase or decrease your sample size. So if we want to increase or enhance the power of the analysis, or <clears throat> then we need to increase the effect size. We need to increase the, <clears throat> sorry, my throat, something went into my throat. We need to increase our sample size. When the sample size is large, even smaller effects will have statistical significance. The reasons are that the larger the sample, the less the error or the less error variance can be expected from this. Just give me a second. So due to law of large numbers, which states that on average, the result obtained from a large number of trials should be closer to that of the expected value. And this implies that when the sample size are large, even the sample effect that uh, can seem to be insignificant can produce a small P value leading to the rejection of your null hypothesis. And this is what will happen with the effect size. So <clears throat> it creates the sensitivity of your statistical analysis. So the larger your sample size, the more closer you might be rejecting your null hypothesis. <clears throat> okay. And we can look at that because your sample size is part of your standard error. And if your sample size is large, therefore, when you divide your population standard deviation, divide by the square root of your sample. So let's say your sample size of 25, which means it will be, if I have 10, it will, your standard deviation is 10. 10 divided by the square root of 25 will be, uh, the square root of 25 will be 5, so it will be 10 divided by 5, which will be equals to 10 divided by 5 will be equals to, to 2. If I have um, the same standard deviation of 10, but I have um, the sample size of 100, 100 square root of 100 will be 10, so it will be 10 divided by 10, which is 1. As you can see, the larger your sample size, it means then your the number that you will use to divide the value will be smaller. The <clears throat> smaller your sample size, the number you're going to divide your values, especially the difference between your sample, uh, your sample mean and your population mean will be bigger. Therefore, it make making it smaller as well. So that is why it says <coughs> for a large sample size, it will have even a smaller uh, sample effect because of the law of large numbers as well. 
So we can also always test this. But I think in your book as well, in your study guide, they do explain it nicely on a table somewhere in terms of the effect size to show you uh, where the differences are. The bigger the sample size, how does it affect um, the size or how does the effect size change as well? <clears throat> so when the population standard deviation is unknown, right? We have been talking about when it's known. When it's unknown, then it means we have a smaller sample size or they haven't given us the population standard deviation or they don't know what it is. We're working with the sample. Therefore, we are going to use what we call a t-test. So everything stays exactly the same, except when we calculate the test statistic, we use the sample standard deviation in state of your population standard deviation. Remember here we had sigma. Here we have a sigma. And when we have um, <clears throat> a t-test, we are using S. The formula looks exactly the same. The null hypothesis statement always contain an equal sign. Then alternative, remember one-sided test greater than or less than for one-sided test, and the not equal. The other difference is on your region of rejection because your region of rejection, you're going to use the critical value from the t-table. Now, finding the critical value from the t-table is different to the z-value. So remember on the z, we used alpha or z alpha over two where we go to the Z table and we're going to go and look at the Z table and the T table just now. For T, we use what we call the, let me just see if, no, we don't have. So for T, we use alpha value for one direction or for directional uh, test or one tail test. We use T of alpha and the degrees of freedom and the degrees of freedom is n minus one our n is our sample size so the same sample size that you use there is the one that you're going to subtract one from it and that will be your degrees of freedom so we'll use the alpha value and the degrees of freedom to go find the t value so Decision will still be the same. So we still use a normal distribution uh, graph where in the middle it's zero. Because it's greater than, we're just going to shade on the greater than sign on the right side. And anything that falls here, we're going to reject the null hypothesis because at T alpha and your N minus one, which will be our critical value. Anything that falls here, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. The same scenario for a less than, it will have one-sided area where it's T. Remember, it's negative when it comes to this side. It will be T alpha and and minus one, which will be our region of rejection. Anything that falls in the red side, we reject the null hypothesis. Anything that falls in the white uh, side, we do not reject the null hypothesis or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Similar, for a two tail, you will have the same. You will have this area and that area. Anything that falls this side, we reject the null hypothesis at T of alpha divided by two and N minus one for both sides. So you will have T of alpha and alpha divided by two and N minus one. So it will be T alpha divided by two. So we take our alpha and we divide it by two so that it can be distributed in those two areas and your n minus one. So we're going to look at the example just now. <coughs> okay, so let's look at this example. 
for a, at the example, I want to share my entire screen so that I don't have to toggle between two screens. But first, I need your statistical table. Um, I know that I used it last week, but it's as if since I closed everything, I closed it. I'll just open. Should be it one of the tutorial letter or your past exit papers. I don't, I have one. Just give me a second for me to find your statistical table and then we can. Yeah, I did find it. Okay, let's just open it and just give me a second. I just want to close my emails and should be fine. Everything that is here should not be a problem. Then I must stop sharing and share your share my entire screen. Okay. Okay, so this is one of UNISA's past exam paper. At the end of this paper, there is a table. There should be some tables. Okay, so <clears throat> this is there. Uh, this is the table for with the Z values, right? So this makes it easier. These are your table for the Z values. These are the Z value. These are the probabilities. So when I talk about P values, we're going to be referring to this. When I talk about critical values, it's something that we also going to find in one of the tables here. Yeah? They should be shared. I know the critical value, but I want to show you where to find the critical values. Uh, and really, seriously, not on this. Uh, table. Okay, so they only give you the Z table. Anyway, uh, probably we will get to that. I'm not sure if you do have a study guide with. Uh, see. I'm not sure if any of this has study guides, so let me open one. Looks like they are all tutorial letters. And they should not have any any table in there. But anyway, if I can find a tutorial letter with other tables, we're going to just use the Z table and work from there. Okay, so all of these don't have. Okay, that's not. A problem. So let's look at this question that we have here. Yeah. Amabato, the social scientist, took a random sample of 30 adults with autism spectrum disorder and found their reading time to be normally distributed with the sample mean. And actually, this example then it's going to disadvantage me because I don't have your T test table. Let's look at this this one, which probably doesn't require a t-test. So this one says, if in a sample of n of 20 selected from the population, the sample mean is 58 and the population standard deviation of 12, suppose that the e-tutor wants to test the following hypothesis, that the mean the, the null hypothesis states that the population mean is equals to 55 versus the alternative, which states that the population is not equals to 55. At 5% level of significance, 
uh, we need to test this hypothesis. So now I need to go back to the question and understand what is it that they have given me. So already they've given me my N, which is my sample size. They have given me my sample mean, which is my X bar. They have given the population standard deviation. Therefore, the population standard deviation is known, which is 12 given, so it's known. I can write also here that it is known because that also informs me that I'm going to use a Z test. Suppose that an e tutor wants to test the following hypothesis. So they have given me my first statement, state your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis. They have given me those statements and I can state that this, based on the sign on the alternative, it is a non directional test. Or we could call it a one. Oh, sorry, not a one, but a two. It is a two tail test. It is a two tail. It is a two tail test. Therefore, it means when I <coughs> find the region of rejection, it will be two values that I'm going to use to reject. Or if I need to go and find the p value, we're going to use this to find the p value that I'm going to be using the p-value. Uh, uh, how am I going to find the p-value using that? So we're going to check that just now. So step number two was that we need to go and find the region of rejection. So based on this, we have a two-directional test. So if I need to find a um, a p value, or not a p value, but a z alpha, which then it means I'm going to find my z of 0, 0,05, which I know that this is the probability. Just want to see if I can use the table. Uh, but also remember, it's a two tail test, so it's Z of alpha divided by two. So it means I must divide this by two, which then it will be Z of 0, 0,025. And I just want to go to your table and see if I can find this critical value on the Z table. So remember that is the P value. So since Let's just make it smaller. If you remember, we said the level of significance is also called the probability, but this is your type one error probability, right? So since I'm looking for 0, 0,025, I need to find 0, 0,025 inside the table um, from all these values that are on here. So it's going to be very difficult to use your tables to find the critical value by just looking at the values within the table. Uh, because I know that the critical value for uh, for 0, 0,025, and since because it is a two sided test, we need to use to find the critical value. We need to use mean. Mean to mean to Z. Probability, so if I go to the table and you look at mean to Z, which is the last column. Oh, sorry, it's not the mean to Z. It is the mean to Z is the second column. You look at the smaller portion not the mean to Z, but looking at the smaller portion. Sorry. Smaller. We're looking at the smaller portion. We need to find this value 0, 0,025 on this smaller portion. So 
okay, on this under the smaller portion. So this are uh, 0, 0,05, 0, comma, we're looking for 0, comma, 0, 0,025. There are four decibels, so I'm going to put a zero at the end. 0, comma, 0, 0,025. If you look at that and you go out to the Z value, this is what the critical value is. So it's 1,96. Okay, so since it's 1,96, that is our Z value, 1,96. Then I have already defined my region of rejection, which is 1,96 on this side and minus 1,96. Because it's a two-tailed test, so it means I will have two regions of rejections. I can just create them. All right, so that is step number two. Step number three was to gather and calculate your test statistics. So now the population standard deviation is known. So it means we're going to use Z, that, that statistic, which is calculated by using the sample mean minus the population mean divided by the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n and substituted the values. Or maybe I can do it right here at the bottom, but it's fine. Our sample mean is 58. Our population standard deviation is 12. Uh, sorry, our population mean is what is stated in the hypothesis. So in the hypothesis, we are told that it's 55. So minus 55 divided by our sub, uh, population standard deviation is 12 divided by the square root of n. Our n is 20. So now, those who are using Casio and your Casio calculator looks like my one and it has a fraction button. If it has a button that looks like this, you can press that because this is a fraction. <coughs> but you can see that is the top fraction divided by the other fraction, right? So it's got a fraction inside another fraction. So you have two things. So you can start with putting the value for the top one, which is 58 minus 55, and then go to the bottom using your down arrow to get to the bottom one, and then also do another fraction. And it will look like this. So you can then put 12 and use your down arrow to go put square root. There is a square root there with the box, with the box. You press that, it will create the square root, and then you just press 20, and then you press equal. And your answer will look somehow like this. Do not panic. At the bottom here, there is an X, sorry, an S with an arrow going to S and D. You just press that, and your answer will be 1.1180. Zero. We're going to keep only four decimals. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's 1.1180. So let's write that back down. It's 1.1180. So now those who are calculating manually, you will need to do the following. You will get the same answer. Uh, we're going to do it step by step. So the first step is to find the difference of the top one, so which is 58 minus 55 equals, and you will get the answer of three and you write it down. And you say that is, that is three, and then you put the divide. Then we're going to solve the one at the bottom. So now at the bottom, you are going to say, um, 12, and you're going to put the divide. There is a divide function there, and you're going to press the square root. Uh, you will see every calculator, both calculator, they do have a square root. 
those who are using their own phone, depending on the type of a calculator you have, if you do not have um, a normal calculator and you are using your phone calculator, which is the normal, normal one, you need to put your calculator to scientific mode so that you are able to use the other functionalities. So you will say divide by the square root of 20 and you're going to get the answer and you're going to write the answer down, which is the way you see it, the long number that you see there, which is 2,6832. 2, I'm just going to write those first, 2,6832. But you need to write all of it. 8157. 8157. That's what you need to do. Three. If you only keep the first two numbers, you might not get the right answer. So you need to make sure that you keep all the values. And once, once you're done, then you can say 3 divided by 2,6832,8157,3. And say equal, and it should give you the same answer as what we got there. If you didn't do that, and you just kept only three or two, so I'll just show you an example. So you say three divide by two comma six eight. Let's say you only kept those ones. And you see the answer is has increased. Instead of you getting eight zero, you get nine four, which is more than that. So need to pay attention to use all the decimals only round off when you get to the end. Do not round off as you are still doing the calculations. But that is your test statistics is 1,118. So where does it fall? So you take that value. So we're going to step number four. We're making a decision. So making a decision, we're going to look at this value that we have here. We're going to see where does it fall? Does it fall here or there or here or there? So it is at the beginning here is zero. It's positive, so it falls in the right hand side. So it's one one. So one one will might be somewhere here. So it falls in there. Um do not reject. We're not rejecting the null hypothesis, so we can say our z of 1,1180 is less than our critical value of z alpha divided by 2 of 1,96. Therefore, oh, let's write it. Therefore, we fail to reject the null hypothesis and state that the mean is equal to 55. That's how you will state your decision and your conclusion. And that is the example. So you just need to know how to do your hypothesis. So even for the T value, you will also do the same. Now, uh, do you have any question? We only left with 30 minutes and I've got some exercises. They will be quick, quick, quick because you are not expected as well to know how to do a lot of these exercises. But hopefully by the time we get to the exam preparation and we're working with lots of calculations, then you should be able to know how to, to do those calculations. So are there any questions before we continue? Um, in the exam, are, are they going to um, give us the formulas or are we allowed to have the formulas or do we need to know them in our head? Um, you're writing online, right? So it means yes. you can you can create yourself a question, a formula bank, uh, a formula sheet. Usually when you are writing face to face, like I, exp I, I showed you, so this will be your exam paper. It would have looked like this when you are, are writing in a venue. Um, it will have the table, 
that it's necessary for you to answer the question and then they would have given you the formulas. So as you can see here is the formula that we have been using and the other formula for the mean with the S and the other one that we're going to be using next week. So they would have given you the formulas or they might give you the formulas because, sorry, because I I don't I haven't seen the exam paper that students wrote last year, um, which was written online or also in twenty last year was twenty twenty one, in twenty twenty when everything went online. So twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one only if I can get a copy of um the past exam paper I should be able to tell you whether you were given formulas or not. But at this point, um, I will guide you and say, or I will suggest that you create the formulas and label them in a way that you are able to use them as when you write the exam as part of your, if if your your exam is a uh, open book, then you, you should be able to have this formulas okay. with you, yeah. The so tables will, as well, so then we can just use the tables from the study guide. Yeah. So, yeah, like that. If they if they have provided you with the table in the study guide, then you use the tables from the study guide. But it will also depend on the type of exam that they want you to write and what kind of information they provide you. But as when we get to the exam preparation, we can discuss that in more detail because then I would get some more clarity in terms of what what is it that the lecturer have sent to you to prepare for your exam and what are the rules that they have set. For now, I'm just speculating because I, I don't know. OK, but yeah, we shouldn't have to learn all these formulas off by heart then. Uh, probably. Uh, by the sense from looking at more or less the, the past exam papers, there are not a lot of places where you need to be doing a lot of calculations. Okay. Um, you, uh, yeah, but as soon as we start looking at the past exam papers, you will see that, oh, but those ones, the calculations that they wanted you to learn which basically for the assignment and for you to know a little bit about some of these sections, um, more or less the, the exam papers that I've looked through in the past years, they were more of theory and more of making sure that you understand the basic things, how things are calculated rather than you doing the calculation. But okay. yeah, we can do that. Thank and you will see with the examples that we're going to be looking at because I took these questions from your past exam page as well. It will okay. give you some idea on the typical questions that they ask. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So looking at this. Uh, <clears throat> looking at this, it says a researcher wants to test and you can see there I've put the where I got the, the exam paper. So the notes will be loaded onto where you find the recording and where you join the session. You, if we don't go through all the exercises, you can also get the notes and look at some of the exercises. If you still have difficulties, we can discuss on the WhatsApp group as well. So let's look at this uh, question. A researcher wants to test the hypothesis that the mean depression score on a depression scale for a patient diagnosed with clinical depression is greater than 120. The statistical hypothesis to be tested is the null hypothesis, the mean is equals to 120. The alternative, the mean is greater than 120. From here, you can already classify what is it that they have given you, what type of a test are you going to be doing, and so on. She uses a random sample of N equals to 64 drawn from the population 
of diagnosed patients and find that the mean, the sample mean, which is X bar, is equals to 127. The sample standard deviation is equals to, which is S, is equals to 24. Which of the following values below is closest to the correct value of S bar? So now, this is one thing that we didn't discuss. But on the first slide, when I showed you the, um, the decision tree, there are two Z test statistics. Um, uh, one of them is represented in terms of the population standard error. And the second one that I've reflected on it, it is the expanded uh, test statistic. The, the SX is also what we call a standard error. A standard error, it is the same. So your SX bar is what we call the standard error, or we can call it your sample standard deviation divided by the square root of N. And this is the same as your population um, standard error. It will also be your population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. If they ask you any of this, they just expect you to know how to calculate it. So let's calculate this. It will be s x bar of s divided by the square root of n. And they have given us n of the 64, and they have given you s of 24. So, you can just substitute 24 divide by the square root of 64. Uh, if you want to know what is the square root of 64, you just press the square root button and press 64, and that will give you 8. So you can say 24, 24 divide by 8, which will be equal to what is 24 divided by 8. 8 goes how many times into 24? 8, 16, three times, right? Or if you don't know, you can say 24 divided by 8. It's equals to 3. So which value is closest to the correct value of the x bar is 3. Even though they put point 0, so a value that does not have a decimal number to it the same as three three we can write it as 3.0 or 3 comma zero uh, it will still remain as three okay so that's how you will answer the question so let's look at the next one so these are other typical questions so you can see where i took this from 2009 october november exam paper the hypothesis which states that the alternative hypothesis that the mean is less than 30 is a mm hypothesis and it requires a mm statistical test. So here yeah, they expect you to say whether it's a directional hypothesis or non-directional hypothesis and it requires a one-tail test or a two-tail test. So when you're looking at this, let's go back. So take note of the sign. I'm going to give you the hint in terms of we can wait here. So there are your alternative hypothesis. Is this what type of a hypothesis? Is it a directional or that directional? What type of a statistical test? It is a one tail or a two tail? A one tail or a two tail. So the upper tail and lower tail, we can always refer to them as one tail test or a two tail test. So since I've given you the answer, I expect you to give me an answer. So the hypothesis of the B, it is a? Directional and one tailed. It will be a directional one tail test, statistic test. So that's some of the questions that you will be answering. Not everything is about calculations. 
When applying a statistical test, the p-value represents the probability of obtaining the mm, If you forgot about this, we discussed it. And there it is. Okay. Are you happy? Let's go back to our question. When applying a statistical test, the p value represents the probability of obtaining the mm. And always remember how we state. The null hypothesis, do we use a sample parameter or do we use a population, sorry, a sample statistic or do we use a population parameter? And what I mean by that is when we state a hypothesis, is this a sample statistic or is this a population parameter? And that will guide you in terms of how you answer this question. Number two, population it, parameter under the null hypothesis. It will be the population parameter. Okay. Question four, it says a type one error occurs when the null hypothesis is wrongly rejected the null hypothesis is wrongly not rejected. The alternative hypothesis is wrongly rejected. Now I'm going to go back because I'm just a good person and I'm in the, in the good mood today to share more than I want to share. So look at this and we're going to answer that question. I can remove all the ink. A type one error is when we reject the null hypothesis when it is true. A type one error is when we detect whether there is a false negative. Okay, you got it? Let's go to our question. Type one error occurs when wrongly rejected. Number one, the type one error is occurs when we reject the null hypothesis. That will be number one. And I think this is second last question. Um, and then we are done. Or maybe probably we can just call it the quit right now. We just need to look at this question. Uh, you can take a screenshot of it so that you can go and do it. I'm, I'm not going to do all the activities so that you can have homework. So exercise five. It's got exercise five and exercise five. There are two. Okay, so the first one, e, they give you information about it. You need to read the information. Remember, when do we do a hypothesis testing when the population standard deviation is known? Which means the population standard deviation is known. We use a Z test, right? When the population standard deviation is unknown, therefore it means they would have given you 
a sample standard deviation, then we use a t-test or t-statistical test or t-statistic or t. So based on this information that is given here, you need to be able to determine whether are you doing which one. Um, and whether also, here you can see that they talk about two groups and one group. I will introduce this again next week so that I can see that you understand the difference between what we did this week and what we will be doing next week. So just look at this and do it and see if you can answer this question. It's very important. And also reading the question, you need to be able to state whether are you doing a one-tail test statistic or a two-tail test statistic, and that is based on what they have given you. Remember, if they mention anything like it's greater than, it's more than, it's less than, at least all those things, the words that makes you use the sign like that, then you know that you're doing a one-directional. Words that say it's equal or it's the same, then they are forcing you to use words like not equal because in your alternative, you will use not equal. So you just need to make sure that you pay attention to the information given because that will tell you how you state your hypothesis. Okay. Okay, this also, we will use it next week. So don't worry about answering number six, but number seven, this you need to be able to answer. Suppose an alternative hypothesis states this. So this is your H, your HA statement. It is greater than, and they asking you if the researcher should test a null hypothesis against the alternative. If there do, you need to be able to state which one, which of these is correct. Right. Remember, so these are very important weights like that. Smaller than, smaller than. This is just there to confuse you, but those three is where you need to be choosing. If you have a word like that, always remember what is your null hypothesis always has an equal sign to it. Okay, let's just recap and close off the session. So what we have learned today is to do a hypothesis testing for one group. And we looked at how we state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, either by using H1 or HA. We test the null hypothesis directly and we try to reject the null hypothesis so that we can accept the alternative and what we have also learned today is that your alpha value is the value that gets set at the beginning and it is what is set by the researcher and it's also called the level of significance. Also, we've learned that you can make decision um, based on the critical value or on the p-value. And if the p-value is smaller than your alpha value, which is your level of significance, then we reject the alternative hypothesis. Otherwise, if we're using the critical value, remember the regions of rejection that you need to be able to know when and where are you going to make those decisions, whether it's a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test. So if it's a one-tailed test, you need to also make sure that you know that if it if it's in the lower side or in the upper side. And if it's a two-tail test, you have two regions of rejection. And also, with regards to the p-value, you also need to remember that the p-value, it is the probability resulting um, from your null hypothesis, or it's the probability of the result occurring under the null hypothesis and you always need to remember that in your null hypothesis we use the population parameter your alternative hypothesis will always state or helps you 
with determining whether what type of a test you're doing and what type of a hypothesis you're doing, whether you're doing a one directional, two directional, or a non directional or a directional, a one tail or a two tail test, right? And an alternative, whether it's a directional due to a smaller than or a greater than, which also deals the same with the region of rejection, whether it's a smaller than or it's a greater than. A two tail test, which is also called a non directional test, the p value will always be twice of that of the directional value. So it means when you find the p-value for a one-directional test and they ask you to find the value of the two-directional test, you just multiply the one-directional um, test by, uh, value of the p-value by two, that will give you a two-directional test. If you have a two-directional test and they ask you to find a one-directional test, P value, you just divide the two directional P value, um, P value, and you divide it by two, and that will give you a one directional P value. And that's it for today. Are there any comments, questions? We are 10 minutes above our time. Please make sure that you. Don't forget to complete the register before you leave. Are there any questions? Because if there are no questions, then have a lovely evening. I will see you and happy learning. I will see you next Tuesday. Thank you very much. Thank you.